joining me for another episode of The Pink Table Talk. I'm your host, Dana Johnson, and joining me today from the Milwaukee County War Memorial at the Wisconsin Breast Cancer Coalition Rare Chair Affair are my four lovely guests. Thank you, ladies, for joining me. I'll start by introducing Keisha with the Sister Network here in Southeastern Wisconsin. Linda is a courtesy of her organization with ABCD. D, our new member with the Sister Network, and Karen, another representative with the Sister Network. Thank you, ladies, for joining me. Thank, Thank you, you for having us. us. So I'd like to begin our conversation. If you could just give me a little bit of insight, ladies, who are representing the Sister Network, just tell me a little bit about what the organization does. Karen, if, if Keisha, if you could please do that. And then I'll go down the line from each one of you and just tell me how you became affiliated with the organization. So we'll begin with you, Keisha. Thank you so much, Dana, for having us um, on the Pink Table Talk. The Sisters Network of Southeast Wisconsin is a breast cancer support group uh, for African American women, and we aim to support women affected by breast cancer in the counties of Kenosha, Racine, and Milwaukee. Um, I'm a three and a half year breast cancer survivor, um, and it was just important to have this type of network in our area so that we can uh, support women and just try to continue to make an impact, um, inform women about the importance of mammograms and self-checks in our community. Thank you. Linda, if you could share a little bit about your story with ABCD. Sure. ABCD stands for After Breast Cancer Diagnosis. It was founded by a local uh, news reporter when she was diagnosed with breast cancer. The goal of ABCD is to help support people emotionally, so we provide one-to-one -one personalized matched uh, a mentor with each participant, anyone who calls for help. It, the services are always free, anyone, anywhere, anytime. Wonderful. Dee, if you can just share a little bit about how you became affiliated and how you found out about uh, the Sister Network. Okay, first of all, Dana, thank you for having me. I became affiliated with first the Sister Network. I was looking for a social group to get involved with in the community. I looked high and low, especially after having COVID, you know, in the city. I was looking for someone or a group to get active with, to actually affiliate with ladies and just get involved with people who share the same experiences of this condition that I was going through. And I also became affiliated with the ABCD net, uh, network, it is a um, mentee, um, after being diagnosed after one day just sitting in my sh uh, she shed, mm -hmm. and I just needed some emotional help. I, I was like having a breakdown and just needed someone to talk to, and I contacted the network and found a mentor. So I'm so thankful for both affiliations. Thank you so much. Karen, can you share your affiliation as well? Yes. Um, so Keisha and I used to um, work together um, at Marquette, and so she knew of my breast cancer um, story. And so when she decided to start um, to charter a chapter for Sisters Network, she reached out and asked if I would be on the executive board. And so, of course, I jumped at the chance to, again, be a part of an organization that's going to bring awareness to breast cancer for African-American women. Wonderful. Thank you, ladies, for being able to just give us a little bit of insight for myself and for our viewers here today. And again, we are at the Wisconsin Breast Cancer Coalition Rare Chair Affair, and it is an honor to be able to have this panel just give us a little bit more insight as it pertains to uh, breast cancer advocacy awareness and research. Um, I'll start with you, Keisha. If you can tell me um, a little bit about when were you diagnosed and at what age, if you are, care to share, and what stage were you diagnosed with? I was, I was 47, um, and I was uh, diagnosed at stage one um, with, with breast cancer. So in July of 2018, I received my diagnosis. Um, and it's just been a blessing to uh, go through this journey um, and be where I am at right now, um, going through um, all the, the different options that were given to me by the you know medical team and um, deciding you know what would be best for me. Um, only having to do uh, radiation, I didn't have to do chemo or anything like that. So 
Um, and everybody's story, you know, you'll hear is different, but just thankful um, that I was still able to be here today. Um, and so I just wanted to advocate for, for other women. Wonderful. Um, I'll address that same question to you, Linda. Again, if you could just tell us when you were diagnosed and at what age, if you care to share, and what stage you were diagnosed at, and how you felt when the cancer was initially detected. I was diagnosed 12 years ago when I was 54 years old with stage 4 breast cancer, and that's metastatic breast cancer. That's the kind that kills people. And although I was initially given 18 to 24 months to live, I'm still here and I just hit 12 years uh, about a month ago. So, um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that meant that uh, I, I told my doctor right out I wanted to be treated with curative intent, even though I know there is no cure for stage four. It's going to get me someday, but I figured. It's not going to get me today. I want to fight this as hard as I can. And so I ha started out with chemotherapy. And then, well, I stayed on chemotherapy. I've been on chemo for 12 years. Uh, and then I had surgery. And then I had radiation. And after that first step, they did scans and said, well, we can't find any evidence of your cancer. But they kept saying, it's going to come back. But I am still cancer-free 12 years ago. So, yeah. You are fighting the good fight. Yeah. <laughs> now, you, you and I will talk um, off camera, and um, in speaking with that, knowing that you are a, um, a new survivor, can you share a little bit about um, your journey and how your support system got you to where you are now? I know you spoke a little bit about wanting to seek out um, organizations to just kind of help you through it, but how was it for you when you, when you heard the words? Actually, I was diagnosed last year, June of 2021, uh, with stage zero of DCIS. <laughs> it was actually funny how I was uh, diagnosed. I actually felt pain in my right breast for the past three years, and I'm a hugger. I'm from Texas, so I, we just hug people all the time. When we see you, we hug you. When we say goodbye, we hug you. We just hug you all the time, and it was just became so painful to me, and then I initially started to feel a lump, and it, the previous month, in May, my mother was diagnosed for the second time with breast cancer, and so I, I was like, okay, well, let me handle business with her first, so I didn't want to deal with any of my pain or issues, but after dealing with her and going to, back and forth to Dallas to visit with her, and help her, I finally went to the doctor to get uh, checked out. And I went in for the regular mammogram, but she asked me, well, where do you feel the pain? Tell me about your history. And I was like, well, my mother had breast cancer. She has it right now. My grandmother had breast cancer. So then they told me, okay, well, we need to reschedule you for an invasive mammogram. Okay, invasive. So right off the bat, I was like, okay, this is kind of serious. So then I went in for that next mammogram, and I was actually riding with my son. He's actually present here today. And I was just rolling in the car, and I had the nurse navigator on the phone, and she told me, well, Denitra, you, you do have breast cancer. And I just didn't, I didn't take it in. I didn't process it. I didn't share it with anyone for over a month. It was um, actually very hard to deal with um, at that time. Even like my husband, they were in the NBA playoffs going for the championship and I was like, I can't, I couldn't tell. Him. I didn't want to be a burden or stress on anyone at that time. I couldn't tell my mom, even though she would understand and relate, but I didn't want to be a burden to her. And that's what made me seek other organizations of people who I could find to talk to to help me. I thank you for being so candid in that respect because it's ironic that we as women always calculate how we can be that that healer and that protector of our village and not thinking of what we may need you know personally. 
And I, I just commend you for being able to just, you know, candidly share that and, and still, you know, coming out on this side and knowing that there are other avenues in which how we can, you know, be healed. And it's organizations like the Sister Network and like ABCD um, that can help us out in that regard. Um, we'll continue on here. And if you wouldn't mind sharing um, on from your perspective, on how you, uh, when you were diagnosed and age, if you care to share, and how you uh, went through your um, survivorship. Um, so I, I believe that nothing happens by chance, that there, there's a purpose for, for everything. And so um, this year, November 1st, will be 10 years. I'll be a survivor. Um, I was diagnosed at age 38. Um, after losing one of my very best friends, and it's gonna, it always gets me emotional because it's coming up on 10 years, um, who was also 37, six months prior to my diagnosis, she passed away. Um, and so I said, hmm, well, maybe I should get a baseline mammogram. Never had one, you know, American Cancer Society says you should wait till 40. I was not 40. I don't have a family history, no mother, no, no one has breast cancer, um, didn't feel a lump, any of those things, right? And so it was just, well, I'll take the, the order, and I put it off. And I put it off until October, because it was Breast Cancer Awareness a Month. Then that reminder, I said, oh, I should probably let me dust that order off and go get my mammogram. And I was on my way to work here um, in Marquette, and I got a call, and it was we found something suspicious on your mammogram. We'd like for you to come back in. So I'm a provider. I know what that means. And so I said, well, let's get this scheduled. And we got it scheduled. And you can, you know, again, when the radiologi radiologist is scanning and they keep going back to one spot, you know, right? And so, you know, my husband is there. And he, you know, he's just there. And then they come in and they say, we found something. And you immediately go back to, my friend just passed. And then you think that that's going to be your story, is the initial thought. And then it's like, mm, I got two kids to fight for. I have a husband over there who's fighting for who he said he was gone. After he heard the word cancer, he just kind of blanked out. And so it was diagnosed the same as stage zero. Um, and then, but the way that the cancer was that they couldn't do a lumpectomy, it was your option was to do a mastectomy. And so I was on full let's go mode and said, we're gonna do double. And they, well, do you wanna counsel? Nope, don't want counseling, I'm good. I know what I'm saying. This is, you know, they looked at him and he said, I'm, I'm just here with her where, you know, and so it was, it was the initial shock, but then you go into fight mode, survivor mode. There are other people I have to live for that you care about, that you're thinking about them, that, you know, I have to stay for them. And so, um, so I had a double mastectomy, um, with, um, reconstructive surgery. Um, I had six months of chemo and then another six months of a medicine called tamoxifen um, that I still take by mouth now. And, you know, here 10 years, it'll be 10 years in November. And so I just thank God. And I, I know that there's a purpose because I'm here with, with other, other survivors and we're telling our story. So wonderful. Thank you, ladies. I appreciate that again with your candidness. Um, I'll start with you, uh, Linda. Can you just kind of touch on the fact that we know being diagnosed is something that we can't control, as many of you have spoken on, but how we handle it in our, is in different ways. What is some advice that you would give to someone who's newly diagnosed? Well, uh, first thing I would say is there is hope. I mean, look at me. I kind of won the lottery in terms of metastatic breast cancer because I'm still here and I feel pretty good most of the time. Um, so that's number one. And the second one is to let everyone who's diagnosed know they didn't do anything to cause this. 
There's no fault. That nothing that we did caused it. And similarly, nothing that we've done is going to cure it. When I was first diagnosed, and I, I wanted to do everything I could, but by the same token, I thought, I'm going to be dead soon. And I'd been training for a triathlon when I was diagnosed. Don't get impressed. It was a sprint distance, and the only goal was to finish it upright under my own power. Um, so I, I called the last part. Most people call it the run. I called it the walk. Um, but I was training, and I, I had this weird pain every time my right foot hit the ground. So I was eating right. I was sleeping right. I was getting exercise. I wasn't drinking. I was doing everything they tell you to be healthy, and I had stage 4 breast cancer. So I figured if that's the way to be healthy and get cancer, and I've only got a couple of years to live maybe, I'm going to stop exercising because I hate doing it. I'm going to start eating dessert first because that's what I want to do. I love it. I'm, and I'm going to take up drinking, and I sure enough did. Um, I, I figured if I've got two years left, I'm going to have fun. And I, I hear all these people say, oh, you have to eat macrobiotic or cut out all, you know, have to be vegan or whatever. I eat whatever I want to eat, and I enjoy every day to its fullest. And I'm going to get out there tomorrow, and I'm going to have fun again. And I'm still here. So clearly, making bad choices does not mean your cancer is going to come back, because I made them all, and it hasn't. Excellent. Excellent. Ladies, would either of you care to share a little of advice as to what you would tell someone who's newly diagnosed? I'll kind of open it up to either one of you. Sure. Um, I would say to to find what your support system, um, I'm prayerful that people have a support system. If not, to know that there's organizations out there that if you don't have one in your own circle, that there are circles that are waiting for, for survivors to join. Um, find what brings you peace, um, if that's your faith. Um, that brings you peace. That That's what brought me peace and comfort. I went to my Lord and Savior and just, you know, ask for your guidance. W let your will be done. If if this is how you're going to bring me home, help me prepare my family. If, if this is the fight that I'm going to be in and you have a purpose for me, reveal that to me as well. And so I would ask, you know, suggest to find what brings your source of happiness and peace. For Linda, it was flipping the script on, on healthiness, right? And so, you know, and I, I too would say, you know, this, this disease brings things to perspective. Those things that used to bother you don't bother me anymore, right? It gives you a different perspective on life and those that are involved in your life. And so just start embracing and loving those that are, are with you and that it's not an automatic death sentence. It's not. It is not. D or Keisha? I would say after being n newly diagnosed, to take the time to process it. I think the biggest thing is processing it, and it's okay to cry, to let it out, and it's okay to share with others. And I think that's the biggest thing um, to get through the diagnosis is to share, to seek out information. There's information all over the Internet, all over Facebook. Facebook has become my favorite friend with the groups on Facebook. I love to just sit and read all the posts that people post. I'm like, oh, my goodness, girl, yes, yes, thank you. It, I'm, it's such a healing process. And... There's different books. I've read different types of books that have helped me, especially like little in journaling every day, your thoughts, your feelings, but definitely to get that stress out, that anxiety out. And as you said, to do things that you enjoy, find those things that you enjoy and to seek out other people as, as I did. That, that truly helped me out. So with our last question, I'd like to know, um, how was your support group? Like, what would you, what advice or what would you tell a caregiver at this point? Like, what were some things that you needed 
you know, personally? Or what are some things that you could recommend to our viewership? Because there may be some people who are newly diagnosed or who found themselves um, just right immediately become a caregiver and not really knowing how to embrace that role comfortably and securely. Um, what would you tell a caregiver? Keisha, I'll ask you. Um, that's, that's a great question, Dana. Um, I would say for caregivers to just uh, be patient with themselves and um, with their family member who's, who's diagnosed um, because no one has all the answers and it's just so fresh and so new. So just um, allowing the time to, you know, forgive yourself if you ask the wrong question, um, to try to just be, you know, sensitive um, because there will be times, I think, as the women have already mentioned, where once you're diagnosed, you may want to cry, you're angry, you're questioning God, you're questioning everyone around you. Why me? Why did this happen? Um, so just give that space uh, for whatever that person needs, but then to take care of yourself, because if you are their caregiver, um, you need to be full to be able to deposit something into someone else. Um, and, and I always say find joy in the journey um, is, is, is what you have to do and just live um, and, and whatever your, if it's faith, whatever your source of strength is um, as the caregiver, as the patient to, to, to look for that. Okay, excellent. Um, is there anyone else who has just a uh, nugget of hope and a glimmer of hope to kind of offer in regards to um, from a caregiver perspective? Well, I don't know about it being from a caregiver perspective, but I have wonderful family and my friends, everyone stood by me, and that meant so much to me. But even so, none of my friends and no one in my family had ever gone through what I was going through. And I was really worried about the future, what was gonna happen to me, what was gonna happen to the family, what was going to happen you know, as I went through chemotherapy and a double mastectomy and radiation and all these things and someone suggested I call ABCD and I called them and they found me a mentor and the first time I talked to her she told me that she had the exact same kind of cancer was going to the, getting the exact same kind of treatment that I was scheduled to get and it turned out we had the same oncologist and she had been five years from diagnosis. So all of a sudden, it was like this black cloud had been sort of floating over my head, and it just kind of broke up and the sun came out. And I realized there was a chance I should have hope, and it made such a difference in my life, which is why I really got involved with ABCD. Wonderful. I'd like to just thank you all again for taking the time out of your schedule to enjoy this beautiful day that we have here in uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And again, we are discussing uh, conversations of survivorship at the War Memorial uh, for the Wisconsin Breast Cancer Coalition Rare Chair Fair. And, and I am your host, Dana Johnson, with the Pink Table Talk. And ladies, do you have any final parting words? We'll start with you, Keisha. Just uh, thank you, Dana, for uh, having the Sisters Network here. Um, and just we're excited to just be here and enjoy this event, raise funds for breast cancer awareness and research. So thank you. Thank you. Linda? I just want to say thank you. I'm really glad you asked me to be part of this. I really appreciate it. It was a great opportunity. And I hope everyone out there who listens to this recognizes there is hope. D. Once again, I just thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure to meet ladies here tonight. Um, once again, just to talk to different people, to hear the stories. I love hearing different stories and the different journeys because we are all unique. Um, and just as y'all mentioned, just there's just different things for people to provide. And I, once again, I'm a hugger, so for me, I just love the hugs. You just keep giving me hugs and just <laughs> love, love, love. I just a lover and I appreciate everyone. And thanks again, Dana. And Karen? Well, I echo everyone on the panel here by thanking you for allowing us to share our stories that it may touch um, someone else. 
uh, out there and know that, again, that this isn't a death sentence. Um, this is, you got a, a panel of hope here. And again, just thank you for allowing us to, to share our, our stories so that it may, again, touch someone. Well, I thank you ladies as well. I am extremely humbled that you took the time out to share the stories because if you've all shared that there is something in each one of us that someone else that's viewing this will be able to pick up on and can pay it forward um, to the next person that they encounter, whether they are a caregiver or newly diagnosed or a survivor for 10 years or more or um, just someone that just needs to be that support person for, uh, for another individual, whether they are a part of one of the organizations that we've mentioned. So I'd like to, again, just make certain that people understand that these support networks are out there. Reach out, and we will have them listed at the conclusion of the podcast as well in the credits. Thank you again, and have a good evening.